In this video, we're going to discuss the fundamental laws of chemistry. This is a group of three laws that are foundational to your understanding of chemistry on an atomic and molecular level. So it's these three laws that I have written out here in the first slide. And uh, the first two are fairly simple and intuitive to understand. And the third one is going to require a little bit more explanation. And we'll go through a few examples just so we can expand on what it actually means. But let's go through the first two. Uh, the first one is the law of conservation of mass, which this just simply says that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. Uh, and this is particularly true for a chemical reaction where you're really only rearranging the atoms involved rather than trying to create or destroy something. So, um, so for the law of conservation of mass, this is actually the reasoning why we have to balance equations. So you may remember from high school chemistry where you had to do something called balancing chemical equations. Um, and basically it's just trying to keep uh, consistent with the law of conservation of mass. So let's take our example uh, of the decomposition of water that we looked at before, right? So we noted that when you decompose water, you can decompose it into its elemental components, but that its elemental components were these diatomics. So you had O2 plus H2, right? So you had these uh, molecules where one oxygen bonds to another and hydrogen bonds to another. If we were to just write it out like this, it wouldn't be valid with the law of conservation of mass because you've got one oxygen here and two oxygens on the other side. You've magically created an oxygen through a chemical reaction, right? That cannot happen. So that's why we add those stoichiometric coefficients in front, uh, which we'll go into much, much more detail with this later. But for now, I just wanted to use it as an example. Uh, you would say that we have two water molecules. Now on this side, we'll have four hydrogens and two oxygens. So now we've got two oxygens here. Now that oxygen is balanced. And then to balance the hydrogens, you just say you're going to form two molecules of H2. So now this would be consistent with the law of conservation of mass. So like I said, we'll go into much more detail on that later in the course, but this is why you have to do this because of the law of conservation of mass. All mass has to be accounted for. Now, the second one is called the law of definite proportions. The law of definite proportions just says that a given compound always contains the exactly, exactly the same proportion of elements by mass, right? So if you have a, a particular compound, a particular molecule, um, in order for it to be identified as that compound, it has to have the same amount of each element by mass, right? So an example of that, uh, for definite proportions, let's say we have water. Right, so any sample of water, doesn't matter where it comes from, is going to have 11.19, uh, so 11.19% hydrogen by mass and 88.81% oxygen by mass. So these are percentage weights by mass. Right. So basically, if something is going to be identified as water, as H2O, it has to have this exact proportion of each element in order to be classified as such. Right. So this is basically what the law of definite proportions is telling us. If we come across a different sample of a, some sort of compound that has hydrogen and oxygen, but it has I don't know, 20% hydrogen and 80% oxygen, that's not water. In order for it to be water, it has to have these exact definite proportions. We looked at another molecule in the previous video, looked at aspirin, and we saw that it was composed of about 30% uh, oxygen, right? So in order for it to be aspirin, it has to have that exact amount of oxygen, right? So, so that's basically what the law of definite proportions is telling us that for a given compound, it has to have the exact same proportions of each element in order to be considered that particular compound. Now, the law of multiple proportions is the one that's going to require a bit more explanation. Now, I'll read out the definition. It says, when two elements form a series of compounds, the ratios of the masses of the second element that combine with one gram of the first element can always be reduced 
to small whole numbers. So let's look at an example of the law of multiple proportions. So this is the most classic example. This is um, carbon interacting with oxygen. And carbon can form two different compounds when it interacts with oxygen. It can form either carbon monoxide, CO, or it can form carbon dioxide, CO2. And the difference between the two is the amount of oxygen that reacts with the carbon, right? So uh, basically what the law of multiple proportions is saying is, okay, if, a, if a one element can interact with us, if, if, two, if elements can f form a series of different compounds, which in this case we'll say that CO and CO2 form our series of compounds, that the amount of oxygen that will react with one gram of carbon can be reduced to small whole numbers. And so what that means is that we'll take the amount of oxygen that, intera that interacts with carbon to form CO2, right, this 2.66 grams, and we'll put that over the amount of oxygen that interacts with one gram of carbon to form carbon monoxide. So this is 1.333 grams. Right now, this can be reduced to a fraction of small whole numbers, right? 2.66 is just two times 1.33. So we end up with a ratio of two over one. And this ratio can be used in order to deduce chemical formulas, right? So if we know that this is basically twice the amount of oxygen that's interacting with uh, CO2, or uh, twice the amount of oxygen that's interacting with CO, then we can we know that this is going to be CO2, and the one on the bottom is going to be carbon monoxide, right? One oxygen versus two oxygens, right? It's, it's a two to one ratio. So, uh, so this is a an illustration of the law of multiple proportions in the case of carbon interacting with oxygen. Now, let's look at a bit of a more involved example here. So this problem says the following data were collected for two compounds of phosphorus and chlorine. So we got two different compounds where phosphorus and chlorine are forming uh, the given compound. So uh, this is the mass of chlorine shown in the table that combines with one gram of phosphorus. So compound A has 3.43 grams uh, that interacts with one gram of phosphorus. This is the grams of chlorine. And compound B has 5.725 grams of chlorine that interact with one gram of phosphorus. So the first question is asking us, okay, show that this experimental data follows the law of multiple proportions. So what you'll wanna do to answer part A is just put those masses that interact with one gram of phosphorus, put those masses over each other in a ratio and see if it reduces to small whole numbers. So basically you're gonna put the mass, for compound, mass of chlorine for compound B over the mass of chlorine for compound A, right? So basically we're going to divide 5.725 grams by 3.432 grams. And so when you divide these, this gives you roughly 1.66, right? So if you put that into a mixed fraction, then that's about one and two thirds right, since you're at the, you know, 0.66, so that's two thirds. So this reduces to five over three, right? So we actually are able to reduce these masses to a ratio of small whole numbers. And so that's going to give us, is proves that it does follow the law of multiple proportions, right? So that's all you're really after if it asks you to show if this data follows the law of multiple proportions. You just wanna show that these masses will result in a ratio of small whole numbers. Okay, so the second part, part B is asking, if it is discovered that compound A is PCL3, propose a plausible formula for compound B, right? So compound A is shown to be PCL3, right? So we got PCL3. Right, so this is compound A, PCL3. We know that there is a five to three ratio between compound B and compound A. So if this is the compound of molecular formula for compound A, 
then the formula for compound B must be PCL5, right? This must be the formula for compound B because there's a five to three ratio between, PCL, between compound A and compound B. So if compound A is PCL3, then compound B has to be PCL5. Okay, so hopefully that introduces the uh, fundamental laws of chemistry and gives you a decent understanding of the law of multiple proportions.